The Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to our online matin service. This is Christ Lutheran Church in Lubbock, Texas. I'm Pastor Hinton. This is the 17th Sunday after Trinity, where our Lord heals a man on the Sabbath and then teaches the parable of the wedding feast. Everything that we need for worship will be on the screen for us. So we begin with the order of matins. Oh Lord, open my lips. Oh, yeah. 
A reading from Proverbs chapter 25. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen do not bring hastily into court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from Luke, chapter 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited... Go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's amazing, if you look at it, how much humor, even sarcasm, really, is in the Bible, if you read it closely enough. In today's gospel, Jesus is kind of mocking the Pharisees. Now, he's not doing it to be mean. He's convicting them of their sin. Jesus had been invited to a Sabbath dinner at a Pharisee's house. And when he noticed how the other guests chose seats of honor, he told them this parable. You can see it, can't you? They're jostling around, trying to be polite, but in reality, they're angling and quickly moving for the best stop at the dinner table. You know how that can be. We all think that we're stealthy and sly, but people notice. Jesus certainly noticed. And then it seems almost like he smiles just a bit. It's almost like he says, you know, here's a neat trick for how to get honor. Don't push for the best seat because you might get kicked off of it by someone who deserves it more than you do. But if you go to the lowest spot, there's a better chance that your host is going to say, oh no, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. Now this is not really a parable about, ad- it's, it's, it's not just advice on how to get the best seat at the dinner table. In fact, this advice comes off a little bit sneaky and not so humble, or certainly someone could take it that way. Jesus is kind of having fun with them. Now, obviously, Jesus is not advocating that you manipulate people and force them to parade you up before everyone so that you get more public honor. This is not actually practical advice. He's accusing them of sinful pride and false humility. What he does is a little bit like our hymn, the one that invites us, challenges us, really, to save ourselves. Seek where you may to find a way that leads to your salvation. Or, seek whom you may to be your stay. None can redeem his brother. This hymn is a little sarcastic, actually. The hymn is not advocating that we seriously look for another way of salvation or another savior apart from Jesus Christ. It's a rhetorical device. Hey, you know, if you want to, you can look for some other way to save yourself, but it's not going to work. That's why the rest of the hymn lays out everything Christ has done and how he and he alone is our redeemer. This parable is a similar kind of thing. Jesus takes his parable from the Proverbs, which we heard earlier in the Old Testament reading, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Now, just like Jesus is not giving practical advice for guests at a dinner party, the Proverbs should not only be read as practical advice for good living. Now, there's some of that in there, but that's not the chief point of the book of Proverbs. It is, of course, true that God's law and ethical instruction based on that law are good, and they're good for you. Those who work to keep God's law will have a happier, more satisfying earthly life than those who deliberately go about breaking it. But that cannot be the only intention behind God's law or the Proverbs or any advice, if you want to call it that, in the Bible, because we know from experience that no one, no matter how hard they try, can keep the law perfectly. And scripture shows us that it is impossible for us to make ourselves righteous enough in God's sight. So while the law or the Proverbs or Jesus' parable do instruct us in proper conduct and true humility, at the same time, they're doing that thing God's law always does. They expose our sins. In this case, showing and accusing our pride. But we also know that the law does not get the last word in the Bible. 
in that parable that Jesus told, there is actually a deeper lesson hidden there for those of us who, by the grace of God given in the Holy Spirit, God reveals it to us. Jesus is the one who rightfully held the highest seat at the banquet table of the Heavenly Father, and yet it was he who was removed from that place and put into the lowest place. He was humiliated beyond our imagination by taking on not only our flesh, but also our sin, being mocked by his enemies, spit upon and abandoned by his close friends, and by suffering by suffering the wrath of the Father while hanging naked and forsaken on the cross. And all that he did, dear Christian, he did for you. His humiliation is your forgiveness. His humiliation is your worthiness, your exaltation. He was removed to make a space for you as the honored guests in the eternal banquet of the Heavenly Father. And you can hear the gracious invitation that goes out to you. Friend, move up higher. But having been moved to the lowest spot, Jesus was also vindicated as the true innocent son, the Holy One. He was raised up back to life, back to the front seat of honor, not for the sake of his ego, but for the glory of God, that God may have glory for himself by saving sinners. That is, after all, how God wants to be known, how his name is glorified, that he is the God who forgives sinners and who raises the dead. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who truly humbled himself and so was exalted is Jesus. But as his Christians, his little Christs, we are to apply this to ourselves as well. And so knowing the gospel, now we are able to return to the instruction that the law offers for us. There are at least three parts to true humility. First, we should be humbled by the knowledge that we are nothing. We are empty. Before men, we are not really one in a billion. At this point in history, we are one in seven billion, doomed to go the way of all flesh, our bodies to return to the dust. And before God, apart from his grace, our lives are ruined by sin. We have nothing to offer God. And while this aspect of humility is objectionable and offensive to the world, I think Christians recognize pretty readily that it's true. After all, we begin our services every Sunday morning by saying, I, a poor, miserable sinner. Now, there's a second part of humility, too. We should be humbled by patiently enduring wrongs. Now, the first one was pretty easy for us Christians, but the second one is a lot harder, isn't it? We may even struggle with even wanting to do it. We know that we should act humble. We know that we shouldn't brag about ourselves, and we certainly don't like to be around arrogant people. But it's a whole lot harder for ourselves not to stand up for ourselves when we are wronged. But our Lord Jesus tells us, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now that doesn't mean that we don't care about justice and truth. We certainly do. Especially when it comes to defending our neighbors. Then we very much care about justice and truth and act upon it. But let's face it. We all spend so much energy, so much sanity, so much time, so much thinking about worrying about all the wrongs that have been done against us and making sure that everyone in our circles knows just how badly we've been wronged, not just once, but every single time. We've not been properly recognized 
for all of the good deeds that we've been done. We did this one good thing and nobody saw it, and what a disappointment that was, because we never got any credits for it. We never got any plaudits. No one gave us an attaboy. No one even noticed. No one but God. We think we deserve better, right? We are proud. We think we deserve honor and good things in life when we actually begin the service by admitting that we don't. What we deserve by our sin is death and hell. We fall into that so easy trap to fall into, of feeling sorry for ourselves and thinking, man, I've just got it so bad. I've got such bad luck. That's the proud thinking that I am so insignificant, the whole universe must be conspiring against me. But of course, this is vanity. Instead, we should learn how to suffer with patience, trusting that God sees all things and is just and will act to save and vindicate us. And now there's a third part of humility, too. If the first one was easy and the second one was hard, well, the third is extremely convicting and hard for us. That is that we should humbly submit to all people. This is extremely difficult for proud sinners. But as Christians, we are called to be servants to everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or as Jesus also said, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. That's completely the opposite of how this world works, right? Even people who are not Buddhists will, will just parrot the idea of karma, won't they? Oh, the universe will get them in the end, right? People openly wish for this. So the idea of the golden rule or of this idea that whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, that's not how most people think. We are not to treat others the same way they treat us. We are to treat others the way we would like them to treat us, even when they don't. Now, this instruction in humility is convicting, isn't it? It's difficult. But as Christians, we have in our Savior the supreme example. In Jesus, we see true humility, perfect humility. He submitted to all people, even though he was more powerful, more intelligent than any of them, or all of them combined. He submitted to his earthly parents, though they were sinners and flawed. He submitted even to Pilate and the other authorities. And of course, he submits perfectly to his heavenly Father and does his will. Jesus patiently endured wrong, false accusations, mocking, undeserved torture, and wrongful death. No one in the history of the world has suffered injustice deeper than our Lord has. Because unlike us, he committed no sin. There was no deceit in his mouth. So all that he suffered was undeserved. And yet, he never complained. He bore it gladly while he trusted his Father to care for him. And Jesus, who is truly equal with God, worthy of the highest honor, emptied himself and counted himself as nothing. Not only is Jesus our greatest example in humility, but also we noticed with this parable, Jesus humbled himself for our sake. He did this so that we who are empty might be filled with his goodness, so that we who should be brought low, might be brought up to where he rightfully sits, exalted to sit with him in his glory. It is true. We are prideful, arrogant sinners, each in his own way, but we will not be severed from the love of God because of what our Savior has done for us. My heart's delight, my crown most bright, O Christ, my joy forever. Not wealth, nor pride, nor fortune's tide are bound our bonds of love shall sever. You are my Lord, your precious word shall guide my way and help me stay forever in your presence. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lord, we implore you, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the devil and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.